My name is Amanda Cohen, and I own a restaurant called Dirt Canny in Manhattan. Oh, my food philosophy is that food should be fun. That's the be-all, end-all of it. If it's not fun, then it's not worth eating or doing. I kind of think I have a make and break uh, moment every day. I'm not sure every day if I'm going to make it through it, and I seem to survive to the end of the day. Uh, I do think sort of probably one of the bigger make or break moments uh, was we got a very good review uh, from the New York Times uh, about four or five years into uh, Dirt Candy's existence, and that really sort of changed the trajectory. We became sort of this established restaurant after that. And that's all it is. <laughs> Dirt Candy is all vegetable centric. Uh, we call ourselves a vegetable restaurant. Uh, our goal is to really celebrate vegetables. When we were opening the restaurant, I sort of looked around and I had come out of the vegetarian world, so I knew I wanted to stick with probably being meatless. Uh, and I looked around and I was like, oh, there's so many like chicken restaurants and so many fish restaurants and all these steak restaurants. And how, how is it possible that there's not a single restaurant dedicated to vegetables? And so everything sort of tumbled forward from there. Uh, I realized that actually being vegetarian was not as important as being all vegetable. And I think uh, we started this about eight years ago, and uh, you've seen lots of people sort of do what we do now, and putting vegetables into the center of the plate isn't as usual as it was. So what are some of the challenges with running a vegetarian restaurant? Ugh, well, you have to work with vegetables, so that makes it really hard to run a vegetarian restaurant. Um, I, the, actually, the greatest problem that we have is that people don't want to spend enough. They don't really value vegetables, and it's really hard for the regular consumer to understand how much labor goes into vegetables. Uh, we, I have a 50-seat restaurant now. We started quite small. We were 18 seats. We've grown to 50 seats, uh, and I have about 15 people in my kitchen every single day. That's a pretty large kitchen uh, for sort of a casual restaurant. We're not quite fine dining. So, and we have to have that because each individual, each vegetable has to be individually cared for, which is really different than when you get like a big piece of meat or fish and yes, you butcher it, but it just, it doesn't take as long as peeling a hundred carrots every day and slicing them into the perfect shape or squaring them off or doing whatever it is, crazy thing that we do at the restaurant. Uh, and that's actually been the biggest challenge is getting people to understand that vegetables have value. Uh, in restaurants, they think they're really cheap or they should be really cheap. And yet in supermarkets, they consider them too expensive. So there's some huge sort of disconnect. You know, I'm not sure if I've quite figured out how to get people to spend money on vegetables. Uh, we just keep trying every day. Um, we, we really try to, one of the nice things that we have at the restaurant is we have an open kitchen so they can see how much work goes into each plate. I do a lot of writing uh, about what it's like to run a restaurant, and so we sort of slip in a lot of information in those articles. And I, one day, I, I hope that we can actually charge enough for the vegetables. We're not quite there yet, so we don't run at the profit that I think we should. Uh, so I haven't been totally successful. The way we will eventually be able to do this is the more people and the more chefs that put vegetables on their menu, and then we can start really charging more, the more it becomes a thing. Uh, my restaurant's kitchen culture is, I think it's really nice. <laughs> um, I'm in my 40s. I came up through some pretty horrible, mean kitchens. Uh, and at some point when I decided I was going to run my own kitchen, I decided that's not how I was going to run it. We weren't going to be a kitchen that yelled, screamed, bullied. Uh, I have a mostly female kitchen. And I think that just sort of tends to mean that we're slightly quieter. Uh, we're a little bit more respectful. We certainly have days when we all yell at each other and want to kill each other, uh, but we take a step back before we yell, and that starts at the top. Uh, I'm not always the greatest boss, uh, but I try. We're pretty aware of that. I don't have a favorite food city. I like to eat wherever I am. Uh, I'm from Toronto, and I will say that right now it's probably my favorite city to explore. Uh, I hadn't spent a lot of time. I moved away about 25 years ago, and the food scene was interesting but it's not where it is now it's it's pretty fascinating and it's really coming into its own and it's right now my current uh, city to explore for food but really put me in any city and I'm pretty excited as long as I don't have to cook the food I don't care um what has me really excited about cooking these days I don't know right now I'm trying to run my restaurant so I'm not quite sure if I'm as excited about cooking as I should be um I will one of the things that's really nice about the restaurant 
is nobody really does what we do. So I don't have any rules. There's no parameters for me. There's no cookbooks I can actually go search out. Uh, we really consider ourselves a, a laboratory and every day we go in and we test things. So it, for me, that's really sort of what gets me out of bed in the morning. I'm like, ah, what are we gonna like play with today? I get my inspiration from everywhere. Uh, I get it from other people's restaurants. I get it from cookbooks. Uh, I get it from walking outside, uh, hearing other people talk about food. It's just all over the place. It is incredibly hard to build loyalty uh, in a kitchen, and it's hard to keep it really friendly. Uh, one of We try to make it fun. Because I have an open kitchen, we've all had to actually learn how to get along with each other because the guests can see it. <laughs> so we, we've had to be much nicer to each other than we probably would have if it was behind closed doors. Uh, and because of that, I mean, you're, you're just nicer. I don't yell as much or I, I quiet yell, but, you know, or we try to make it really funny when we yell. Um, so that if the guests hear, they know that there's something going on, but it's part of a show. And so that's that's one way that we're actually not a mean kitchen. Uh, but we try to have a lot of fun with our staff, and we try to really listen to what they need and what they want. Uh, I can remember coming up in kitchens and working 60 hours a week for very, very little pay, never getting the day off that I wanted, uh, and just sort of you know keeping my head down. And although that's a really good policy, you should keep your head down and do the work you're expected to do, we try to really uh, give our staff a little bit more of a life. And I think they see that we're trying really hard to do that and it makes them want to keep working for us. Yeah, so Dirt Candy uh, was one of the first restaurants to eliminate tipping in New York City. Uh, I did it for a couple of reasons. Uh, I had put out an ad about maybe five years ago uh, for a line cook and I didn't get any responses. And I had I have a niche cuisine and for a long time I would get like hundreds of resumes. There's not that many high-end vegetarian restaurants. Uh, doing what we do and they're just I wasn't I didn't get anything and I was like this is weird <laughs> like, what's going on here and I sort of took a step back took a step back and looked at the industry and I was like there's no cooks in New York because how can they live here you know they're going to cooking schools and then they are moving to every other city because it, the cost of living in New York is so high um, and one of the things that had happened is we haven't really changed the pay rate, the pay scale for line cooks. And I, I can't speak for other states, but in New York City, uh, we're basically paying line cooks the same thing I was making 10 years ago. It really hasn't changed that much. And yet the cost of living in New York City has gone up exponentially. So I was like, oh, I got to find a way to uh, pay my cooks more. Uh, but I don't make very much money, so there, there wasn't a, there's not a lot I could take from my profits. Uh, we run on a very, very slim profit margin. Then I looked at my front of house, and I had a very unique situation at my uh, first restaurant, at what I call Little Dirt Candy. We, we had one server, and she was great, and she worked incredibly hard, uh, but she had a lot of help from me, from my dishwasher, from the other cook, and she was making about $500 to $600 a night in tips. The way New York State works is that she couldn't share that with anybody. Certainly not me. I was the restaurant owner, but she also couldn't share it with my dishwasher, who was the busboy, uh, because they weren't part of the tip credit system, or my line cook, because they weren't part of the tip credit system. That's a little bit unique to New York, although there's quite a few uh, states that have that law. And she wasn't opposed to it. She was just like, you know, we were like, well, we can't break the law. So I was like, okay, but that's crazy. She's making $500, $600 a night, and my line cook is making maybe $120. Like, how, how can we exist in this sort of world? And then I started doing a lot of research into tipping and it's really a system that is unfair. It's very sexist, very racist, very misogynistic. And sort of once you delve more into it, uh, it's hard to, well, it was hard for me to stick with it. It's just not a system I wanted to be a party of. And then, um, and then I also had this realization that we're kind of doing a disservice to our customers. And, and one day this was, it's going to come back and uh, bite us. We're pretending to our customers that they're not paying that much for their food. We are artificially keeping the cost of the meal low and then letting them sort of make up the difference with their tip. And we've basically outsourced our payroll, our front of house payroll to our customers. And I was like, well, why are we pretending, like, why are we all pretending this system is okay? Let's just charge what we're supposed to charge. 
let's you know pay the back of house a little bit more yes the front of house will probably not make quite as much but hopefully you know we can make that difference up or it won't be such a great difference if my server's making 500 and not 600 that's probably not the worst thing um yeah and so that those are all the reasons why i got rid of it and so far so good we've had a little bit of a struggle getting people to still spend quite as much as they used to but i think it's changing and other restaurants in new york are starting to uh, hop on the no tipping train uh, minimum wage is going up quite quickly in new york state so everybody's going to have to figure out how they're going to deal with that you know the restaurant industry has changed so much uh I, we used to have sort of this uh, let's say triangle with the the biggest uh an inverted triangle where there was more fine dining than, you know, more uh, casual than you had fast casual and uh, I guess super just quick service. And now it's completely switching, right? Fine dining, it seems to be disappearing. Uh, and you sort of have, actually probably at the top is you have the fast casual and then in between you have everything else. Uh, my restaurant is casual fine dining. Um, we're not that expensive. Uh, but we have servers, we have food runners, we have bussers, we have really nice silverware and glasses, but we also don't have tablecloths. Tablecloths are usually a sign of like a much nicer restaurant than, or like a fine dining restaurant. Um, I could, at the moment, I can't be a fine dining restaurant because I can't get people to pay that much for vegetables. I wish that uh, we could find some sort of happy medium because so much seems to be getting pushed to fast casual where restaurants are starting to seem pretty disposable to me actually, uh, where people are going in and out less than an hour. Uh, it's very little about the experience and more about, hey, I was there and this is the food. And to me, growing up, going out to eat was all about the experience, so much less actually about the food. It was about the service and the people you were with. And for that, you need a couple hours. And that is quickly disappearing. But most people spend all their time on the phone anyway, so why bother being at a restaurant? The greatest advice I can give anybody is to... Really keep your head down, listen to your chef, uh, and stay loyal. Um, there seems to be a new trend where uh, workers are coming in for like six months and then moving on to the next one just so they can get someplace under their belt. And you will never learn enough if you keep doing that. You've really got to stay at a place for at least a year, if not a little bit longer. Work through all the stations, work through all the seasons, uh, maybe even, you know, stay till you get a promotion, see what that, that's like so you can move on to a better position at your next job uh, and really work hard. The, I really need, I, I need everybody to stop focusing so much on the end and assuming you're going to be this great chef. Hopefully that'll happen. It might not. But the journey is what makes it really exciting and sticking, you know, uh, to your guns and, you know, really exploring your career, that's much more satisfying than sort of this end goal of, hey, I'm going to be a famous chef one day. You probably won't be. You might be. I don't know. But that shouldn't be the only goal. So right now, vegetarian dining in the States is just coming out of its dark period. Uh, I think we've sort of been moving away into a much better period for about the last eight years. Uh, but really, there was a long time in the vegetarian movement where the restaurants were a lot more about sort of the ideology and less about the food. That the flavor of the food was much was secondary to the fact that this was a restaurant supporting these ideas, uh, be it for your health, be it for the environment, political reasons. There's a myriad of reasons that you know vegetarian restaurants exist. Um, those restaurants are sort of slowly disappearing, and what you're seeing is more restaurants that, like I've opened that are really focused more on the food and the flavor of the food, and you're getting chefs with some more experience who are coming in and exploring it. I'm not sure where we're going to be, though. Uh, I'm not sure that this isn't a very, very small trend. Uh, every year, you know, I read these articles where they're like, this is the year of the vegetable. It's never the year of the vegetable. It's always still the year of meat and, you know, pork is still king. Uh, but we are seeing people putting more vegetables on their plate. I'm just not sure we've crossed the hump yet. Uh, you know, everybody hears about kale. Kale, super vegetable. Everybody's eating kale. It, the percentage of kale that's actually eaten in this country, is, it's so low, it doesn't even, like, merit a percentage point. It's like 0.001%. Um, so we haven't quite crossed those boundaries in, you know, mainstream uh, North America yet. Uh, in 10 to 15 years, I 
think maybe we'll see a little bit more of a balance, but I, I certainly don't think it'll be all vegetarian restaurants and meat restaurants will be the, um, the you know, meat restaurants uh, will be the exception. Ugh, the only personal quality that's helped me succeed is that I have a sense of humor. If I couldn't get up and wake up, if I couldn't wake up every day and laugh at everything that was about to happen to me, then I certainly wouldn't succeed. And um, really, that's it's the biggest thing I have. It's it's the greatest sort of asset. Uh, you have to be able to look, laugh at all your mistakes and accept that you, you know you're going to fail before you succeed. <laughs>